So tonight we're going to talk about, here's our title, How to View Sin in the Life of Another. Uh, so uh, one common thing that we see in our lives is that uh, as, as we take on our own battles personally against sin, uh, we also witness others in this world who are battling sin too. We're all in a battle together. Uh, some in the world try hard not to sin. Uh, others not so much. Uh, some try to hide their sin, but at uh, times we find out about their sin e- anyway, even though they try to hide it. And what I want to focus on tonight is the mindset we should have when, when we view sin in somebody else's life. Uh, the Bible has plenty to say about not being overly critical of our fellow man. Also, uh, not condemning unjustly using man-made rules or man-made religion. Uh, so it's got to actually be sin. Sin is a transgression of God's law. Uh, but how do we respond the way God would want us to respond when true sin is committed on the part of another person? Not us, somebody else sins, as is defined by God's word. What should our reaction be when someone legitimately violates the law of God? Should we be surprised that people of the world are sinning? Should it sadden us? Say probably. Um, Should we be disturbed by it? Yes. Uh, We're going to study the fact that uh, our eyes, until the day that we die, will see much sin in this world committed by other people. Uh, Surely we are among the group trying hard on a day-to-day basis not to sin. Uh, But as we study our Bibles and we come to know well the definitions of sin, what do we do when we see sin in the life of another? Uh, How did Jesus train us to react when we see sin in someone else's life? He taught us how we're to deal with it in our lives. How are we to deal with it in the life of another? How do we we address sin? And that's what we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, So I have 13 points for you uh, on this list that we're going to cover tonight. On this topic, we're going to start here. Uh, The first thing we must realize when we view sin in someone else's life, is to acknowledge, number one, I have sinned too. Romans 3.23. First and foremost, uh, when we see someone else violate a law of God, it's important in order to have a proper view of the situation that we have a humble attitude that says, well, this person just did something that I myself have done too. Perhaps not the specific sin that they committed, but... They've violated the law of God. And it is true that I have violated God's law at some point and at different points several times in my life as well. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one of us who could ever stand up and claim that I'm in a different category all my own, seeing as how I've never violated the law of God. No one among mankind can say that. Uh, So what's happened is this, something written in in Scripture, as God set parameters around our lives for right and for wrong, by which he'll judge the world on the last day based on what's written, moral obligations as well as religious obligations, this person violated a command or went beyond something that was forbidden by God. First and foremost, I've done that before too. I've fallen short, we need to say, and recognize I've fallen short of the glory of God in a similar fashion to this person. So in that category, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not different than they are. It was in John chapter 8 where Jesus taught that, uh, this very mindset that he wanted all of us to have about sin in the lives of our fellow human beings and how we should approach it and, and, and sin in the life of another person. So the adulterous woman who was caught in the very act Guilty of violating the law of God, and she was. The Jewish people were ready to stone this woman, according to the law. And the Old Testament law said she would be stoned. And they were ready to put her to death, according to the law of Moses. However, Jesus silenced the crowd that day in teaching this lesson. And he taught, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. John chapter 8 and verse 7. 
Now we'll come back to this story in a little while, uh, and I'll mention that there are some implications here that are not at all what the Lord had in mind with this teaching session and how he handled the situation, okay? People run with this and do some things they're not supposed to do. But we have studied this true concept before. Uh, If it were that all sin should be punished without forgiveness, then we rightly know that every one of us would stand in the condemned position ourselves along with the adulterous woman of John chapter 8. That's, why Je- that's what Jesus was teaching the crowd in this chapter. If it were that there was no room for grace, no room for mercy or a second chance, then here's the thing. You wouldn't get a second chance either. If there's no opportunity at repentance uh, and forgiveness and a turning away from sins, then neither do you benefit from it yourself. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Thus, in John chapter 8, Jesus taught about his gracious second chance available to all after sin has already been committed. This woman had sinned. And no, Jesus by no means belittled the fact that this woman had sinned against the holy God. Her sin was still a big deal. Uh, And it technically was deserving of condemnation. But his goal that day was to get the crowd to realize that without heaven's grace, they all stood condemned in the same position as this pitiful woman. And so do we today. If you're supposed to, uh, he's saying to the crowd, if you're opposed to her being forgiven by God, then you surely reject the idea of yourself being forgiven of your sins. And we we will come back to this story in just a little while. But first, Paul said it well, I think, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, referring to the ancient Jews who so arrogantly looked down their nose at the wicked Gentiles as though they were so much better than the Gentiles with regards to sin, when in reality they really weren't. He said, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another you condemn yourself. Now, here's the key. For you who judge are practicing or have practiced the same thing. The idea in this passage is that the same list of sins that you can read about in Romans chapter 1, which the ancient Gentiles had violated, it just so happened that the ancient Jews violated the same laws. Equally guilty. They were equally guilty of falling short, and uh, that was Paul's point. Verse 2 But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Right? Sin will be judged. But listen, without the forgiveness process, that means you'll be judged along with the guilty too. Jew and Gentile alike. Verse 3, And do you know and do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things, and you yourselves doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Are you going to escape the judgment? Verse 4, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? Do you not want him to give goodness to the world, forbearance and long suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Don't miss what Paul is saying toward the first century arrogant Jews. Jews, don't you think they deserve a chance at repentance leading to life if you had a chance at repentance leading to life? If you violated God's law and got a second chance, then why, in the case that they violated his law, should they not get a second chance? And that's the gospel. I believe that's exactly what Jesus was trying to get at in John chapter 8 with the adulterous woman, the concept of a second chance. And so number two, because of this truth, uh, when we view sin in the life of another human being, we must then put off self-righteousness. It goes along with point number one. Uh, if, if you're going to view sin with the proper lens, you must first realize that you are, or at the very most were, in the same category as them. You are no better than they if we're, taking, uh, if we're talking about perfection. You're no better than they are if perfection is on the board. Because you weren't perfect, they weren't perfect. We have that in common. Uh, don't uplift yourself to a God-like position of sinlessness. Because if you pretend that is the case, you're lying to yourself and the truth is not in you. 1 John 1, 8. We say we have no sin. We, have, we lie and do not practice the truth, it says. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, 
Jesus taught us the same, the same thing as well. Uh, not, to, not to be unaware of the fact that we have sin in our lives too. Or at least that we have done many things poorly in our past. And so in the context, we learn, and again, Matthew 7 is another one people run wild with and make uh, unbiblical claims. But in this context, we learn of someone ready to condemn another, now don't miss it, who is currently practicing the same sin themselves. All right, that is going back to the concept of hypoc- being a hypocrite. Again, hypocritical judgment. You know, and imagine in John chapter 8, someone ready to throw a rock at the woman who had committed adultery, who was in private committing adultery themselves. And they're going to throw a rock at her. Jesus said, no. No to hypocrisy in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. So here's what he said. Don't judge in a manner that you would not like to be judged, is the idea there. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with uh, the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you're, gonna do, uh, if you're doing the same thing as them and haven't repented yourself, and then, realize, then you need to realize that God's going to pronounce the same judgment upon you. If you're hitting them with that hard standard, you're going to be hit with it as well if you do not repent yourself. Verse uh, 3 says, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't even consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. Listen carefully to these, these instructions. First, remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to... Remove the speck from your brother's eye. So don't miss this. Jesus said, I want you to help your fellow man in regards to his and her sin. You need to be mindful of your brother's sin. I want you to help them remove their speck. But here's the thing. Not until you take care of the plank that is in your eye. And taking care of the plank doesn't mean you're perfect. Okay. If you're not willing to repent then you are equally as condemned as them. You might remember Jesus drawing this out in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee uh, and the arrogant attitude that the Pharisee had, acting like he had never had a sin a day in his life. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 11, the Pharisee prayed to God and said this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. That's the attitude. I, I thank you that I'm so good. Not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector who was in the same room as me. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Right? I'm a very religious person. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector recognized that he was a sinner, And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Uh, The one who acted like forgiveness of sins wasn't something he needed, would surely receive no forgiveness from his sins. Uh, But the man who recognized that he himself had fallen way short, that's the first step in being forgiven, to acknowledge that we have sinned and have sinned. So number one, uh, when I consider someone else's sin. I first need to look back over my own history, the history of my life, and it would help my attitude with how I deal with other people if I look at myself first, okay? And I need to acknowledge that I have great sins in my past. And if I'm in a position where they've been forgiven, I still need to remember from where I used to be. Um, Number two, I need to put off self-righteousness. I'm not a per, you know, none of us are perfect people. So when someone else sins, don't act like you've been perfect yourself. And now number three, let's look at some basic, uh, basic principles about sin here. Number three, when we see a, uh, a person sin, we need to understand the basic principle that sin, in general, separates mankind from God. Whenever a person sins, whether that be myself or someone else, The truth stands, a danger of going to hell is imminent when sin is committed. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, 
and your sins have hidden his face from you so that you, he will not hear. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Uh, Romans three twenty three again, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So number three, whenever a sin occurs, we must have an acknowledgement that this sin separates mankind from God. This is the danger for anyone who violates the law of God, and we must consider what heaven says about sin. Number four, a defeat in sin ends in death. That goes for all people, uh, you and me included. If sin has the final victory over a person, we know the Bible says it's not good. Uh, James 1, 14 and 15 says here, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, right? the violation of the law of God. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death, spiritual death. So when, when you are seeing someone else in sin, first off, hopefully it is that you care about them. And it legitimately concerns you that uh, the same danger that you face can also be the outcome of this individual for the same reason. Sin, once committed, if it is not removed from the record of a human being, the end result will be an eternity in hell. And that, too, is something we must understand regarding sin of another person. And that's why it should actually concern us, because I care about that other person. Uh, if we have the right heart, there will be a concern that they won't make it to heaven if this sin is not removed from their soul. The same worry, hopefully, that we've had about our own souls will be the same worry that we have about the soul of another. It's not that we're trying to judge them harshly. It's not that we're trying to condemn. We're, we care about their souls. We say, I, you know, I surely don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. But you know, I don't want them to go to hell either. Because I care about them very much. I love them. Thus, number five becomes all the more important for us and for them. Number five is that Jesus provided the sin removal process. This is the principle of the gospel and the forgiveness of sins and how that works. The most outstanding thing is available. Uh, and it's available for you and for me, and for anybody else in this world who has sinned, meaning everybody, the remission of sins. Here is this circumstance, and, and we know that it is because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross that those who have sin on their souls can have it removed because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, this truth is very pivotal. This truth can save us. This truth can save them. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Take heed to yourself and to the teachings from God. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will both save yourself and those who hear you. And thus it is, if you study the gospel sent from God in the first century, the Bible teaches human beings how to properly deal with sin and to get them removed from yourself. And this is the same process for other people. Once you learn it for yourself, it's your hope that other people will do it because you want them to go to heaven. And we know the plan. We put it up here every week. A sinner must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, believe in Jesus' identity and who he said he was, his entire message. And listen carefully to this one. A sinner must repent. And we'll come back to this one. He must confess the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized in water, immersed to access the remission of sins, accessing the blood of Christ. Now let's go back to the idea of repentance. Because this is the only step in the plan, really, that pertains to our practice of sin in our daily lives from day to day. I mean, you could count point six, but point three and point six really go together, living faithfully or repenting. Um, so repentance as a condition of Christ is a change of mind regarding our violations of God's laws. A change of mind that is going to lead to a change of your life. You're going to be different when you repent. Uh, and you're going to do different things after you repent. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 13, 3, you must change your mind, is the idea, about violating the law of God, or else be condemned. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. 
Uh, this is the condition for how one deals with sin in their lives. Involved in forgiveness is the repentance of sin. And so if you were a thief coming to repent, part of that call to have your sins taken away is to change your mind about your stealing. Uh, if you are sexually immoral or covetous or envious or lustful or any of the listed sins, Jesus says you've got to recognize it and change your mind about your violation of God's law uh, in your day-to-day -day life. If you meet this condition, I'll wash away all your sins and cleanse every stain. So this entails being sorry over, for, for your sins, recognizing the wrong committed, and the determination to live a life where those actions do not rule in your life anymore. A change of mind that leads to a change of life. New creatures, the Bible calls it. A new creation, born again, John chapter 3. Jesus said to the adulterous woman in John chapter 8, I do not condemn you, for I'm giving you a second chance. Now do what? Remember what he said? Go and sin no more. Do you understand? That's repentance. Jesus always taught repentance with his forgiveness. Jesus was saying, if you determine that you are not going to persist in that life of sin any longer, if I see an attitude change and a great attempt at a lifestyle change, then if you make that change of mind, I'll wash away every sin. Thus, a person not willing to turn from sin can never be forgiven. We learn that the sin removal process is conditional. And that is conditional upon man's constant willingness uh, to repent from sin. Matthew, or sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, For if we go on sinning willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Then, after we repent and are baptized, if we slip up, all the scripture tells us that we need to do is pray to God on behalf of the sin, Acts chapter 8, 22, confess the sin, 1 John 1, 9, and determine to repent again, Acts chapter 8, verse 22. And that verse in Acts 8 says, Repent, therefore, of this your slip up, your wickedness, and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Now, this was after baptism. And so with a, a new relationship to sin, I suppose I should say a, a lack of relationship with sin. And with a determination to put these things to death in our day-to-day -day lives, Colossians 3 and verse 5 says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are on the earth. Put these things to death is what mortify means. Don't pursue them anymore. Kill these things in your lives. Fornication, that's unlawful sexual intercourse. Uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Kill these things in your lives. Verse 9, why? Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Since these things are put to death and you don't determine to do them anymore, having been forgiven, you have the constant sin removal provided to you by the blood of Christ. And it's, it's all based upon the repentance of sins. Then Jesus said to, him, said to them, Thus it is written, <laughs> Thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now listen to this part. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Luke 24 and verse 47. Notice that remission of sins is always directly linked to repentance. Acts 3, 26. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So we got to change. Next, number six. After we have dealt with sins in this fashion in our own lives and obeying this gospel and submitting to Christ, after having put to death the deeds of the body and we're not walking in darkness anymore, but walking in light, 1 John 1, 6 and 7, what comes to mind next when someone in the darkness commits a sin and we see it is this. Hopefully, acknowledge Hopefully we acknowledge this. Number six, thankfully, I am in constant fellowship with the sin removal process. Although I have sinned too, I am no longer in the same category as the lost people of this world. First John 1, 7, I'm walking in the light. Romans 8 and verse 14, I'm led by the Spirit of God and I'm a son of God. 
Colossians 2.13, I have been forgiven of all my trespasses. And Hebrews 10.26, I do not go about sinning willfully. But then after acknowledging that I've provided safety for my soul in response to the gospel, then comes my focused attention onto this other person's soul, having great concern for it. Because when I understand how it works with me, I understand how it works for them. Number seven is the big question. Has this person who just sinned accessed the sin removal process by the blood of Christ? The question is, have they ever heard and obeyed the gospel like I have? Have they accessed the saving grace set up plainly through this heaven-sent message? Do they know about the requirement of repentance and turning away from these sins in order to be forgiven, not continuing in them for salvation of their soul? Do they know about repentance and how that's part of the picture? You can't continue in sin that grace may abound. Romans 6, 1. And with many people in the world, uh, we find out they don't know about this. They're not attuned to this. They don't know about the true plan of salvation. A lot of them go to church, but they have not opened their Bibles to read what it actually says. They don't know about the conditions for having one's sins washed away properly by the blood of Christ and what it takes to keep those sins off. Conversely, many have uh, been assured by a false plan of salvation. They've been taught a plan of salvation, but it's a false plan uh, not given from heaven. Some even teaching that you can have forgiveness of sins without repentance from sins. One of the most dangerous doctrines that exist. What has this individual been taught? Is a very important question. Next, number eight, the next most important response that we must give is the same response that Jesus taught us to give in John chapter eight with the adulterous woman. I do not condemn you. Let's study it. What does Jesus mean? What did he mean by this statement? Because many missed the point here hugely. Does he mean, I don't care that you committed adultery? And it doesn't matter to me. That's not what he's saying. Or, uh, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter that you violated the, the law of God. I'm just going to let you go to heaven anyway, no matter what you do. Is that what he's saying? No. In quote, not condemning this woman. Here's what Jesus was saying. Woman, I'm still giving you a chance at heaven to be found right in the sight of God in spite of the fact that you have sin. That's what Jesus was saying. I'm not here at this time, he says, to throw you into hell. That's not why I'm here. In fact, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want to throw anybody in hell. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter. Jesus says, instead, I want to give you a second chance at this. And I want you to come and live with me. It is not time for condemnation. I'm not here for condemning. Yes, in the future, though, Jesus promised to come back, eventually bringing condemnation. It's coming upon those who will not repent. And when he, come, when he came in the first century, however, he said, but not yet. Condemnation's not here yet. I'm not here to punish. I'm here to bring grace. And thus, he taught men and women the conditions of this grace, the gospel system. And it is clearly seen in his response to the woman in John, John chapter 8. Jesus said, woman, where are those who have accused you? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Because we know he had got them to think about their own sins before they threw the stone. She said, no one's, no one's here anymore. It's just you and me. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. Note that phrase, walk. You're not going to walk in darkness because you're going to go and sin no more, right? 
So here's the concept. Sinning no more, walking in light versus walking in darkness is, is all that I require of you. Walking in light versus walking in the darkness. I want you to walk in the light. And the sin removal is as good as yours if you'll repent. So even though you've sinned, it can be removed. But you must repent and change. You must have a mindset to change. Uh, and uh, sin removal is as good as yours from heaven. But if you will not repent, there will be no remission of sins. And so uh, when people of the world today sin against God in the same way, our thought process needs to be exactly the same. Number one, I care about this soul. Number two, I don't want to see them in hell for their sin. Number three, forgiveness is available for all those willing to repent and be baptized, Acts 2.38. And number four, I do not wish to pronounce hell upon them now. And that's not even really our job. God's, God will do it, but he's told us the criteria. There is still life in their bones and blood in their veins. It might be that they'll hear the gospel and repent. And I am glad at the idea that they may heed the call if I teach it to them. And they won't bring condemnation upon themselves. Next, number nine. Uh, this might seem like an odd question, but when someone sins, ask yourself, okay, someone else just sinned. It wasn't me. Someone else sinned. Is this person in the church or out of the church? This question is important because how we're told to handle a person's sin is slightly different based on if they're in the Lord's body or out of the Lord's body, having obeyed the gospel or having not obeyed the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, Paul said this with reference to those inside the church versus those outside the church. He wrote, For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Well, those who are outside, God judges. Now listen carefully to number 10. We'll come back to that. We do not judge those, or sorry, this, this is a question for me. Do we not judge those inside the church? Let's say this is we see someone sin and, and they're a Christian. What does the Bible teach us to do regarding only those who are in the church? How do we handle that situation? Well, we are to cast judgment, actually, upon another, upon each other. As true accountability par partners and watchmen over one another's souls, we follow Jesus' principle laid down for church discipline, we often call it, in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18. Jesus said in Matthew 18 about two brothers in the Lord, if your brother sins against you, really the idea is if, if, if he sins and you find out about it and his, his soul is in danger because of a sin, what do you do? Go and tell him his fault. Tell him about his sin. Talk to him about his sin. Between you and him alone, don't go gossip about it. Don't go tell it to everybody else. Go talk to him about his violation of God's law. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. What are you trying to get him to do? You're trying to get him to repent. James 5, 19 and 20 words this well, talking about those in the Lord's church. Brethren, that is literally saved ones. If anyone among you, saved people, wanders from the truth and someone goes and gets that saved person and turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. By the way, this is one of the verses that sticks a nail in the coffin of the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. Right. James said, if a saved person wanders from the truth and a faithful brother or sister helps talk to him and bring him back into the light, what has he done for his brother's soul? He saved that soul from death. He covered a multitude of sins. Someone who had been in the church. A child of God can be lost again, contrary to popular belief. Thus, if this is a Christian one who knows the truth, one who has access to the blood of Christ and they know about this process. If a Christian sins, you are commanded to have a spiritual conversation asking them to repent. Uh, and if they hear you, you gain your brother back. And then we won't go into tonight the rest of the, the plan from Matthew chapter 18 about bringing others into the picture and all that. We understand that. But then no, consider number 11 from uh, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 13. But those who are outside, God judges. Here's this idea. If you see someone out in the world and they are committing continual willful sin, the Bible teaches that 
they don't have a chance at all in their current state of living unless they respond to the gospel. There's no forgiveness out there. They're just as good as condemned if they haven't responded to Jesus Christ yet. Thus, the idea here is regarding a non-Christian, God already has judgment pronounced on them unless they come to him. It reminds me of what Jesus said uh, about those who trust in him versus those who would not trust in him. John 3 and verse 18, Jesus said, He who believes in me, and that's the idea of, of putting their tr- life's trust in him. He who puts their trust in me is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the uh, only begotten Son of God. He's not listened to the Son of God and followed the plan. Those outside are already judged. Thus, how do we respond when we see sin from someone in the world? Number 12, preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the message of getting into Christ. Teach them about their sins and teach them about salvation and where it's located, how to attain it, as we studied a little bit ago, and preach repentance about the lifestyle they're living. When we see that they've sinned, repentance is still part of that process. And preaching that truth is what will set people free. Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's how you're going to get your sins washed away. Repent and be baptized. Some people get baptized, they don't repent. It's not going to remove your sin. Some people try to repent, they don't get baptized. not going to remove your sin. Repent and be baptized. That's how you gain access to this. Mark 16, 16 says, He who believes it and is baptized will be saved. So sin, uh, when we see it in the world, whether it's a Christian or a non-Christian, sin should make us sad. I didn't put it up here, but I thought of a righteous lot. It vexed his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. It bothered him. Uh, not just that they were gonna, not going to make it to heaven, but sin. You, you don't like sin. You don't want. You learn to hate the things God hates and love the things God loves. So sin should make us sad, and we should care for their souls out there. Um, but then that should motivate us to preach them the gospel. Lastly tonight, number 13. The watchman who sounds no warning is partially responsible for the condemnation of the wicked. And again, this one could be a lesson in and of itself. But this is Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 in the Old Testament. God says this, When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. And when he, when he, by the way, when God tells the wicked, you shall surely die, he always gives them reason for why they shall surely die. He, he's always instructed us about sin, the things he's going to condemn, He says, I've given you the instruction. I've given you the message. Go preach it to them. When I say you shall surely die and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. Notice you're going to save his life if you preach him this. That same wicked man, if you don't preach it to him, he will die in his iniquity. Yes. But his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he's not turned from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So you just got to warn the wicked. If, if they are going to respond, that's on them. But you need to warn the wicked. Is that unrighteous judgment to warn the wicked? No, it's not. It's righteous judgment. John uh, seven twenty four. Thus, our conclusion tonight then is very simple. If we see sin in another person, whether that be a Christian or a non-Christian, if we don't have a heart, to sound the warning kindly. Galatians 6.1 says, in a spirit of gentleness for that person. If we don't sound the warning, God will charge us partially responsible for their guilt. We'll have guilt on ourselves. But if we warn them, trying to help them, and yet they don't repent, then God will still deliver our soul. So do we have a responsibility to the sinful people of this world? It's part of the Christian obligation. We have to teach. We have to show the warning. Uh, And that is our instruction.
So that's our lesson for tonight, how to, sin, how to deal with sin in the life of another person. And hopefully we can preach this gospel and to everybody and try to live this righteous standard and keep sin off of our record as well using this process. So if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you got to get in. You've got to get into Christ and His church where forgiveness is located. You do that by hearing the gospel, believing that Jesus Christ was the one sent, repenting from sins, uh, repenting of a whole lifestyle of sin, confess Him for men and be baptized in water to enter the kingdom. The forgiveness of sins is located there. And you come up out of that water having signed this awesome heaven-sent contract, and you just have to be faithful to it until death. When you slip up, Pray to God, repent of that sin again, and confess the sin, and He'll keep you cleansed. Uh, so if anybody has a need to come tonight, uh, we offer the invitation as together we stand and sing.